Well, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning and to have the opportunity uh, to speak. And uh, thank you, Pastor Tracy, for the invitation. Um, I'm actually hoping that uh, as I share some of my own story today, it might be a help uh, to you in your walk with God. Uh, It's been an unusual preparation time for me leading up to today. I actually joked with uh, Pastor Tracy this past week and told her that I'd been praying for direction uh, for the message. I kind of had the core of knowing what I wanted to speak, but then it's all the details and how everything fits together that gets a bit, uh, sometimes it's a bit uh, just trying to lean on God and, and trying to understand the direction and what to say, what not to say, all these things. And so I'd been praying for direction and taking some time in prayer and just waiting And uh, not really getting much. And um, I joked with Pastor Tracy and said, I think God is in a different time zone. Um, Because there were three nights this past week at 4 a.m., pretty much on the dot, that I woke up and I knew what, like, there's just another glimpse as to what I needed to share. And so um, I joked and I said, like, I don't know why we're not, maybe I'm in the wrong time zone. Uh, Maybe that's the problem. I don't know. But uh, anyhow, it's been... uh, It's been good. I I feel strongly about what I'm sharing this morning, which is good for any speaker to feel strongly about what they're sharing, of course, and uh, I just pray that uh, God will use it to encourage you and perhaps uh, grow his roots a bit deeper into your life today. I've always liked uh, vegetable gardening. Um, Might be an odd thing to start a message with, but uh, I have. Uh, I actually shared a truth with uh, Susan yesterday. Uh, I said, I don't know if I've even ever told you this, but uh, when I was in grade seven, Um, which is a long time ago. But when I was in grade seven, uh, all the clubs and things that would happen in the schools, I was in the tomato planting club. (laughs) I tried to keep it a secret for a while, but eventually the word got out, I got to say the girls were all over me. And uh, because if if, if you're in any club, the tomato planting club, that was at the top of the list, I got to tell you. Anyhow, I, just as far back as I can remember, I, I love planting things. I, watch, I love watching, seeing them grow and, and just the whole process. And um, my first large-scale attempt at gardening uh, didn't quite go as planned. Uh, Susan and I were living up north at the time. Um, and it's funny because people have a different reference for that. I'm not talking Barry. Um, I'm talking like drive eight hours north of here, like an hour northeast of Timmins is, is north. And uh, some of you are laughing because sometimes when people here in southwestern Ontario say, I'm going north for the weekend, that means Barry. And Barry is not north. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so I had planned on trying out my hand at gardening vegetables. So I had actually cleared a patch of our backyard. And uh, so the plants arrived at the garden center. And um, I got a bit carried away. Up until that point, everything, we had lived in apartments and just inside. And so I had tons of potted plants in our apartments and inside the house. But this opened up a whole new avenue for me to uh, garden outside. And so I had tons. I came home with uh, just way too many. And again, in retrospect, I got carried away. I got very carried away. And I uh, came home from the garden center. I had, there were plants everywhere, tiny little plants of uh, all vegetables, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchinis. I, I don't even think at that point in my life I had ever tried a zucchini, but I just thought, hey, if I can grow it, I'm, 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 growing, I'm getting them. They're on sale. Uh, lettuce, peppers, eggplants, and again, I still don't even like eggplants, but again, I just if you can grow it, hey, why not? So anyways, I got a spot for that too. So I, I bought all these things. I loaded the, we had a minivan at the time, brought them all home. And again, as has happened so many times in our marriage, Susan's just rolled her eyes and uh, saw all the plants that I had bought and just thinking, don't know what you're doing with all those, but uh, good luck. So again, I I will remind you, we're about eight hours north of here, which is not prime gardening uh, temperatures and things. So I got home, I sunk them all in the ground and, and I waited. Chaos would be an understatement <laughs> uh, to, to describe the situation. Within two or three weeks, uh, there was absolute chaos. Uh, the spacing of the plants, again, in retrospect, I look back and I, I shudder to think all the things that I did at that point. Just spacing of things was not done properly. Uh, plants beside one another, big, tall, shading out other things. It, it was absolute chaos. So within two or three weeks, my plants, many of my plants had already died. Others were overgrown, some were stunted and not producing anything. It was absolutely ugly. Um, I harvested very little that first year, and I I do. I I cringe to think back uh, to my complete negligence in the garden that year. I did learn a lot that year, though. Apparently, you actually need to do stuff after you sink the plants in the ground. (laughs) 
and beforehand too, if you really want them to do well. Um, so the next year, I will say this, the pendulum swung. And so I was out there all the time. I was watering, I was fertilizing, I was pinching, I was pruning, I was weeding, I was mounding, I was doing all these things, learning all these terms and looking on YouTube and figuring out what I needed to do. So I was out there all the time, probably too much. Um, it, it, truth be told, I, I was the helicopter parent to my plants. And I just could not leave them alone and my plants were probably saying to themselves, stop touching us, stop touching us. Because I was always out there, I was always doing something to them. Things were tolerable that second summer, but I was so stressed out and worried that I was doing things wrong and that I should always be out there and I, there was obviously something else I needed to be doing and so I was always doing something and it was so stressful. And I learned that no matter how much I do, uh, I can't always make my plants grow perfectly. And if you've been in gardening for very long or done much vegetable gardening, you know this. Uh, there are certain things you can control, but there's a whole lot of things that you cannot control when it comes to gardening. And so things like weather, uh, things like insects and uh, precipitation and frost, again, remember, we had very late frost where we were and very early frost in the fall. Uh, usually we would only get to about this weekend and we had to start worrying about frost when we were up north and so it was a very short gardening season. Um, animals, I had wild animals in my yard. At one point we had black bears in our yard, that's how north we were and so uh, it's one thing to shoo a cat out of your backyard if it's getting into your vegetables. At one point, I had a black bear, and I still joke about this story. Uh, I ran out to my backyard because there was a bear sitting on my beans, and uh, I ran outside yelling at this bear, get off my beans, and my neighbor came out wondering what was going on, and uh, so anyways, it's me yelling at a bear to get off the beans, and uh, weird story. I was a strange neighbor. Anyhow, so there's a lot of things that you can't control. So two summers of gardening and two lessons learned. Lesson number one, you, you can't sit back and do nothing in a garden and expect the garden to produce to its full potential. But lesson number two, as the pendulum swung the other way, you can't make your stuff grow just through trying harder and spending more time doing things in the garden. There are other factors that are out of your control. So in the following summers, I was in a weird spot when it came to my garden because I thought on one hand... I can't do anything, or I can't do nothing and expect the plants to grow to their full potential. But on the other hand, I also just can't try harder and work more hours in the garden to ensure that everything works out great because there are always things that are outside of my control. I don't know about you, but God seems to speak to me. We all have these places and times that God speaks to us, and for me, it's usually when I'm outside. I don't know what it is. I've always just attributed it to I, I get better reception outside or something. <laughs> If I'm gardening, if I'm camping, if I'm hiking, if I'm running trails, those are the moments. Maybe it's just the quiet of the day or I'm out kind of by myself and there's no noise in those moments. Maybe that's, maybe it's, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's not better reception. But it's usually when I'm outside, uh, that's when God speaks to me or I really sense him speaking to me. And that's when God spoke to me about my experience in the garden. And unfortunately, he didn't give me an answer about the gardening side of things, but what he spoke to me about was about relating my experience in the garden to a life of faith. Uh, in my own um, walk of faith, I've struggled with this same tension that I experienced in my garden for those two years, and let me explain. Um, do the following two options sound familiar to you at all? One, do nothing, sit back and wait for God to change you, or the other side, pendulum swings, we try so hard to change ourselves because we know we're supposed to be different, we're supposed to be living different lives, and so we try and we try, we grit our teeth and we just try and try and try, and yet still, sound familiar to anybody? Hmm. The frustration bouncing between these two options drove me nuts for many years as a young adult. I was keenly aware of the fact, because we hear it often in our churches and we know it instinctively if we've been around churches for very long, that we're supposed to change. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to have a different outlook on people and circumstances. To sum it up, I knew I was supposed to change and continually be changed more like Jesus, but I really wasn't sure how. Sitting back and praying, God change me, certainly didn't seem to be working, but neither did trying harder to learn and force myself to become loving and force behavioral compliance to God's kingdom values. It might have worked for me for a, a moment or two in public or perhaps on a Sunday morning I could force some external behaviors to go in line with what I thought was appropriate, but nothing seemed to be changing inside me for the long term and for the long run. 
Just like my situation in the garden, I found it frustrating and I wasn't quite sure what to do. I don't think I'm the only one who has wrestled with this, and even by the show of hands this morning, I, 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 that kind of confirms it. You see, we know we're supposed to change and live differently to be more like Jesus, but we're not entirely sure how this happens sometimes. And so people like me, and perhaps you see yourself in this as well, people oscillate between two extremes in practice, doing nothing, waiting for God to change us. I remember at times very specifically, just out of frustration, saying, I can't change myself, God, and so go ahead, do it. And, and we sit there. It's almost like we sit down on the chair, we fold our arms, and we almost dare God to change us because we don't know what to do anymore. And then we try harder to change ourselves. And both of these options are often met with frustration and exhaustion. Instead of either sitting back and doing nothing or trying harder and harder and straining to make ourselves act more like Jesus in specific moments, I would suggest this morning that perhaps we should begin learning to live our life in the same manner as Jesus did, by following his example, living our lives in a growing dependence and complete trust in God. Moment by moment, day by day, as it says in John 14, 4, it says, remaining in him. In doing this, we recognize and affirm the truth that, yes, it certainly is God alone who is able to transform us from the inside out by his grace and by his power. It's God that produces the real life change in us. Or anybody who's gone through that process would readily recognize that. It's not us that changes us from the inside out. That's a God thing that happens in us. But we also affirm and recognize that there are things for us to be attentive to and active in through the process of change that God desires for us. We can't just sit back and almost dare God to say, hey God, hey God do it, change me. Uh, there are things that we're to do. As my story from the garden illustrates, I can't make my plants grow, but I can certainly be active and attentive to the many things that will ensure that my plants are healthy and reach their highest potential. And I believe the same is true of our life of faith and our life of transformation. This brings us to our text this morning. I want us to take some time to look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14 this morning. Just read through the passage, and then we're going to kind of work our way through. Starting at verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. One of my college professors frequently said, all theology is a matter of emphasis. And what he meant by that was that we have a tendency to emphasize certain thoughts about God and hold particular truths over others, both in our beliefs and in the way that we work them out. You can observe this on an individual basis, and you can also see it on a larger level when it comes to our churches. Many of the different denominations within the Christian faith operate a bit differently. In many cases, it's not a matter of being right or wrong, it's just different. People have placed either greater or lesser emphasis on certain issues and on particular beliefs. And what I want to take some time to explore today is the truth that God's grace goes further than forgiveness. I want to remind you of the beginning of our passage this morning. It said, verse 11 says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And so our first truth is God's grace brings salvation. This is one truth that many evangelical churches and denominations have tended to strongly emphasize. We speak a lot about salvation. We speak about uh, God's ability to save people. We sing about it in many of our songs of worship, and we frequently talk about God's ability to forgive our sin and to set us free. And to be honest, this is something that we should rejoice over. We should be talking about it, and we should be singing about it too. But I would propose to you this morning that as fantastic as that truth is, the amazing grace of God actually goes much further than simply offering forgiveness to people. How we understand this word salvation is very important. Even as he wrote this letter to Titus, Paul's view of the salvation that he mentioned in verse 11 was much deeper and much wider than what we commonly hear in our churches today. 
In this passage that we're looking at this morning, Paul is actually taking an opportunity to remind Titus what this salvation really looks like. Paul is giving uh, definition to this word that we might commonly hear in our churches, and yet we might actually understand it at such a shallow level and perhaps practice it and live it out uh, in such a narrow way. Remember the words of my professor in college, theology is a matter of emphasis. In verses 11 to 14 in chapter 2 of Titus, Paul is actually expanding his teaching to Titus on the work of God's grace in our lives. And Paul teaches us that God's grace reaches much further than forgiveness. I heard a funny story a while ago. It's in the book that I'm holding here, and I just wanted to read it to you. Just enjoy it. It's called The Parable of the Race. Consider the parable of the race. Once upon a time, in a land of boredom and drudgery, exciting news had spread. There's going to be a race, and all who run this race will grow strong and they'll never be bored again. Exciting news like this had not been heard for many a year, for people experienced little adventure in this ho-hum land, beyond attending committee meetings, waiting in lines, sorting socks, and watching sitcom reruns. Excitement grew as the day of the race drew near. Thousands gathered at the appointed town, at the appointed place. Most came to observe. They were somewhat skeptical about the news. It's too good to be true, they said. It's just a silly rumor started by some teenage troublemakers. But let's stick around and see what happens anyway. Others couldn't risk the uh, invitation. Arriving in their running shorts and their shoes, as they waited for the appointed time, they stretched and they jogged in place and chatted among themselves with nervous excitement. At the appointed time, they gathered at the starting line. They heard the gun go off, and they knew that it was time to run. But then something very curious happened. The runners took a step or two or three across the starting line and then abruptly stopped. One man fell to his knees, crying, I have crossed the starting line. This is the happiest day of my life. He repeated this again and again and even began singing a song about how happy this day was for him. Another woman started jumping for joy. She said, yes, raising her fist in the air, I am a race runner. I am finally a race runner. She ran around jumping and dancing and getting and giving high fives to other people who shared her joy at being in the race. Several people formed a circle and prayed, quietly thanking God for the privilege of crossing the starting line and thanking God that they were not like the skeptics who didn't come dressed for the race. An hour passed, then two hours Spectators began muttering. Some laughed. So what exactly do they think this race is? Two or three strides and then a celebration? And why do they feel superior to us? They're treating the starting line as if it were a finish line. They've completely missed the point. I certainly appreciate the humor that we find in this parable, but it might hit a a bit close to home. It's a funny story for us to consider, perhaps a reminder for us to check our understanding of this word salvation that we hear about and sing about so frequently, and yet all of us might understand it and practice it so very differently. Is our salvation about a moment? Is it about, starting, uh, is it about crossing a starting line? Or is it about something much deeper, much greater? Something that might involve our, our whole life and might just include others around us in a constant and perpetual process of learning and growing and becoming. It's a good opportunity for us this morning to think about our own views on salvation and and how we understand it. Please don't misunderstand me this morning. Forgiveness is a wonderful and a glorious start. It's an essential starting point for us. But here in this letter, Paul was pointing to the continuing lifelong work of God's amazing grace in our life as we remain in Christ. In Paul's understanding, God's grace and salvation goes so much further than this one-time transaction of forgiveness. God's grace reaches deep and actually teaches us a new way to live. It's really quite revolutionary. Not at all something that's just an add-on to life as normal so that you can go to heaven when you die. And the more that I've thought about it, that actually makes perfect sense to me. Let me explain. Early in my life, I wrestled with the limits of grace. And what I mean is, I grew up in a church where I noticed that God's grace oftentimes seemed limited to forgiveness. And what I mean by that is that one-time transaction of salvation and grace to constantly be forgiven for falling short and sinning against God and the people around me. But as I've grown and matured in my faith, I've recognized that the grace of God is much bigger than that. It's far deeper than that. 
My view of who God is, who is, has become much larger, I believe, and it's been more accurate through the years as well. I guess one major question that I wrestled with was this. Would a loving God who is filled with grace and compassion just leave us in the condition that he finds us? Why would God constantly remind us of our shortcomings, constantly demanding again and again prayers of repentance and sorrow? Can I imagine a loving God withholding his power that could help us gain victory over the brokenness that seems to dominate our lives at times? Can I imagine my Heavenly Father refusing to offer his grace to change my life, not just for a moment, but as a lifestyle? I think much of this reflects back to the importance of our understanding of who God is. Who we understand God to be is incredibly important in our formation. I just can't picture a God who expects us to change but leaves us alone to do it. I believe that God intends that each of us would come alongside God and receive his loving and gracious strength to transform our lives on a perpetual and daily basis. And I once heard it said this way, God desires for us to live a life of perpetual renewal with him. And I love the way that that is worded. I love that language. God desires for us to live a life of perpetual renewal with him. Always growing, moving forward, and being renewed sounds so much more appealing than praying a sinner's prayer, doesn't it? And I believe scripture certainly affirms this truth that we're talking about. God's grace reaches so much further than forgiveness. God's grace reaches deep and actually teaches us a new way to live and empowers to live, this, to live that life as we are led by God's Holy Spirit. Not once and for all, but as a new way to live life with God. God's grace and salvation is so much greater and more significant than a moment or any one-time experience. It's an invitation to living every day with an awareness of God's presence with us and living with an attentiveness to God's loving will and desires for us each and every day. Regardless of where we are, what we're doing, or who we're with, we can carry this awareness and attentiveness with us through our days. I believe that this grace that we're talking about this morning has the power to continue to transform people's lives as long as we're living on this side of heaven. This grace is so much greater than we often understand. And this salvation, this new way to live in Christ is what Paul expands on in the following verses in Titus chapter 2. Paul continues to write in verse 12, we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. So God's grace goes further than forgiveness and God's grace also leads us to say no to certain things. And it's funny because the NIV actually uses these words, it talking about God's grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. The more I know, the more I truly believe that God doesn't want us forever trapped in a cycle of sin and forgiveness. Spending the remainder of our lives just continuing to sin and asking God to forgive us back and forth endlessly until we die. And yet this almost seems normal for so many people. You see, the great news is God's grace reaches further than forgiveness. Grace keeps on working in us, empowering us and teaching us how to resist temptation and to say no to godless living. Properly understood, when we are living in Christ, the grace of God extends to us before we fall into sin. It empowers us to recognize and say no to it. God's grace breaks the pattern of brokenness and destructive habits in us. So many people are quick to recognize what they shouldn't do as followers of Christ, but we need to be reminded that this is only half the picture. I talk to some coworkers at work at times, and a lot of times their understanding of what a Christian is, you've probably had these weird conversations as well. Oh yeah, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't, you know, they, they start going off on a whole line of things, but everything they say is in the negative. It's what they don't do. Anybody else had this conversation? And you hear it sometimes from Christians too, which is mind-boggling to me. You see, if our faith in our Christian life is only shaped and formed by what we don't do, we are missing some vital and essential elements. A person might not do a whole bunch of these things. They can go down that list and they can still be the furthest thing from God ever. See, it doesn't take long reading scripture to realize that it frequently gives the encouragement to make an exchange. To stop doing one thing in favor of or in exchange for something much better. Better for us and better for God's kingdom. I hate to ask you this, but i got to go there this morning. This should be fun. Have you ever told somebody to stop worrying? (laughs) How'd that work out for you? (laughs) 
Speaking from my own experience, just my experience, many times in my well-intentioned, uh, and I would also add deeply loving uh, efforts, I've told people to stop worrying. And I've even gone the extra mile, and um, I will say I've gently and lovingly educated them about how worrying is a waste of time. Anybody else been there? Doesn't go well, does it? Doesn't help. It actually often makes the individual worry more and, and throw in a side of frustration there too. One key that I've found helpful to remember when it comes to changing behaviors is to remember that effective behavior change is seldom only about stopping one behavior. It's about starting another beneficial and positive behavior to take its place. You see, it's never just about stopping something, it's about displacement. Ceasing one activity or behavior and filling that void with something better. Behavior change. It's not just about what we don't do, it's about what to do instead. It's not just about stopping one thing, it's about displacement, it's about exchanging one behavior for something better. And scripture has many examples and encouragements toward this sort of exchange. I was recently thinking about this and I thought, perhaps instead of telling people, just don't worry, <laughs> don't worry, maybe I should be pointing people to consider who God is. Maybe I should be pointing people to meditate on God's love and his kindness and his generosity and even as we've sung about this morning, his amazing grace. You see, when we remind ourselves of these characteristics and focus on these incredible qualities of God, what worries could we possibly cling to? It's displacement. I wonder if this might be a better way to respond when those around us are battling against worry instead of just saying, stop worrying. Something for us to consider this morning. Again, Paul's teaching about the reach of God's grace is no different here. Listen to all of verse 12. I only read half of it before. We are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Grace offers salvation and forgiveness, absolutely, but grace reaches much further than forgiveness alone. Grace leads us to say no to certain things, and we can also learn here that grace also teaches us to say yes to certain things. As we live in Christ, in daily trust and an ongoing dependence upon him, we become aware of the freedom for living that's available by, by his grace. We don't have to remain in the same old ruts of our broken patterns of living and our living without God. God invites us to something far greater. And this should come as no surprise to us. We see this pattern and example numerous times throughout the New Testament. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 21 to 24 is another example of this. Just listen this morning. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Throwing off one thing, putting on another. Action words. These are the things which the Bible seems to indicate that God will lead us to as we live a life in dependence upon him. As we live our life in Christ, his spirit will continually lead us to make this great exchange. Putting off one thing, putting on another. Stopping one action, starting something better. Exchanging dead-end actions for life-giving and abundant kingdom living. While we're talking about this, I've got to clarify something. Because I'm well aware that there are times when we need to stop obvious behaviors of brokenness and exchange them with godly replacements. And to just blow, uh, just, I, I love exaggeration, uh, ask my wife. Ask her a million times, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm such, anyways. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To blow it out of the water, it, we, we all know, like, Murder, if you're murdering people or robbing banks, we know we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, I, just, I, I mention this because sometimes we can uh, magnify things and make it into a league where it doesn't really apply to us. But I think the exchange that we're talking about this morning, especially for most of us that would be here, I know it's certainly true in my own life, is that it's a lot more subtle than that. It's a little bit more under the radar as to what sort of exchange needs to happen in our life. Maybe it's not so obvious to you, even as we're talking this morning, some stuff. If, if it is, then by all means, God's leading you to, to deal with those things. But uh, if it's not, there's always things that are a bit more subtle and perhaps under the radar in our lives that sometimes we need to make that exchange for. Let me tell you a story from my life to illustrate that point. 
I spent about eight years working as a youth pastor in churches, and in one of those churches where I served, I had this crazy senior pastor who had the nerve to tell me that he wanted me to take a week of my life and to break it down into half-hour time segments and to document every half hour of my life for that week in order to see and understand where my time was going and what I was doing on a weekly basis. And I gotta say, I was not thrilled with the idea. Have you ever tried to stop every half hour to write down what you've been doing for the last half hour for a week? There's a lot of half hours in a week, I will say that. Doing this for the whole week, I remember it being very challenging and just by, uh, it was probably, uh, uh, yeah, my, my attitude was probably not the best for the first half of that week. But as the week went on, my attitude got a bit better, I think, and uh, I finished documenting the half-hour segments. And at the end of the week, something very interesting happened. When I tallied up where I spent my time and what was occupying my attention for a good part of the week, I was actually quite surprised. A large part of my time and attention was being spent on things that I really wasn't interested in, and I really wouldn't have guessed even prior to doing that exercise. It was a bit of a wake-up call for me in that season of my life. It was a reminder that we can deceive ourselves so very easily. Just because we say that something is a priority for us doesn't mean that our life and our actions always back it up. For me, this was a moment where I literally observed on those half-hour timesheets what I was presently doing, where my time and my energy and my attention were going on a weekly basis. So I saw that, but I also began to understand what I wanted and needed to exchange these behaviors for. I wanted to exchange them for something better. It was an enlightening moment for me. And so this morning, I need to say thank you to that crazy senior pastor. Thank you, Pastor Del Wells. Thank you, Pastor Dell, for being that crazy senior pastor (laughs) who had the nerve to make me go through that exercise many years ago. (laughs) Truth be told, I've actually repeated that exercise all on my own uh, in other seasons of my life, and it's actually been a very helpful tool to grow in my own self-awareness and paying attention uh, and, and praying for wisdom and knowing how best to spend my time, my money, and my attention. So i got to ask you this morning, how about you? What might that exchange look like for you? Maybe it first means growing in your self-awareness and tracking your life for a week in half-hour increments. And don't blame me, don't blame Pastor Dell. Uh, just maybe if God's leading you that way, just do it. It's very enlightening, I, I will say that. It's a lot of work and sometimes it can be a bit of a distraction, but once you get in the routine of it, you start to see some patterns and sometimes God can use that to speak to you. You see, maybe it means a little less time on, and money on Amazon and exchanging it for something with a greater return. I know, shots fired, I'm stepping on toes this morning. (laughs) Maybe it's a little less time on social networking sites and redirecting some of that time into cultivating stronger relationships or serving in a capacity that you're passionate about, either here at Freedom or in the community. Maybe it's spending a little less time streaming shows and entertainment and exchanging a bit of that time for cultivating the habits that would lead to deeper relationships, either with Jesus or with other people. Maybe joining a life group or a connection group in the fall. I don't know, but I hope you'll consider going through that exercise in the coming days. When I was beginning my message, I was going to wish you a happy new year because it always feels like a new year, doesn't it? We get to September, you laugh, but it's, it's true. Like I actually wish somebody at work happy new year and they kind of looked at me and they were like, I get it. And I said, yeah, January 1st and whatever, like Labor Day, just it always feels like a new beginning. So at this point of new beginning into the fall, I sure hope you'll consider doing something like this. Just before I leave the topic of this whole exchange, just think for a moment about the story of Jesus at the home of Mary and Martha recorded in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. If you recall, it won't come up on the screen. I just wanted to make mention of it. Martha was busy with meal preparations while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus listening to him. I just want to remind you, (laughs) Martha wasn't doing anything bad or evil. Uh, She was actually doing what was normal in that culture. She was preparing a meal for Jesus and his disciples as they passed through. But be reminded of Jesus' words. He said, Mary has chosen what is better. See, it's not always a matter of good and bad choices, evil or righteous decisions. I think those ones are oftentimes very obvious for us. Sometimes it's just a matter of what's good and what's better. And I pray that God would help us to choose what is better. 
I truly believe that God's empowering spirit will give us the wisdom, courage, and strength to use exercises like these half-hour timesheets and financial budgets and other tools to help take inventory of our resources and make the appropriate changes for God's kingdom and his glory. May God help each of us to make changes and choices and exchanges that are better for us and better for God's kingdom. See, grace, grace teaches us how to live and what to say yes to. Grace empowers us and enables us to exchange our old, ungodly, broken, harmful, empty, unproductive ways of living for godly, significant, relevant, and positive actions instead. It's a completely different way to live, one that is led by God's grace through the continual empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's a great exchange, one that we're invited to participate in today. What I find refreshing about this change of perspective is that it's not a matter of either or in extremes. And what I mean is this, it's not sit back and let God do everything. Again, that, that classic prayer, go ahead, God, change me. Uh, nor is it try harder and harder. It's all up to you to change and be better, just gritting our teeth and trying harder and guilting ourselves to try and do more. As I've found through my own personal experiences, and perhaps you have too, neither of these approaches works really well, uh, if, if at all. And they often end in frustration and walking away from the, progress, or the process that I believe that God is inviting us into. You see, it's all about the beautiful and wonderful partnership of life in Christ. Pastor Tracy, you said before, no, 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 you're, you're not coming yet. <laughs> you're just itching to go. Um, you joked this morning, and, and I know you always say it, no heresy, um, and, and again, just so we're clear, there's no heresy coming here, but a number of years ago, I started reframing some things in my understanding and my relationship with God, and it may sound odd to you, and I know that it bothered a number of people. We were uh, pastoring up north at the time, and I, I had, was talking through some of these things, and again, I didn't say anything out of line, but just I want you to listen till the end here is all I'm saying. Because um, one person actually walked out of church that one morning when we were up north. And uh, again, when they heard the full story, they were fine with it and they understood. And again, it's just kind of a reframing that sometimes needs to take place. Um, I was simply talking about wrestling through, because I was going through a, a transition again in my own understanding of things. And I was wrestling with, should we be pouring all of our effort and our attention into living life for God? And again, because that's what I grew up with, that's what I understood. We should be living for God, and we hear for God all the time. And we should be living for God, and it's all about him. And I don't disagree with that. However, um, I, I started really wrestling between that phrase and living life with God. Yeah. And living life with God <laughs> was much more attractive to me. And so I said something, again, I was, uh, might have been a bit of an idiot at, the, at that moment in my life. <laughs> And I said something along the lines of, you know, I've stopped living for God. And uh, anyways, that's the point at which they uh, left. But uh, see, it's not so bad if you stick around to hear the second part. And instead, I wanted to live life with God. The statement might surprise you. However, I, I would encourage you to take some time to think about it. Is our focus, should it be living for God? Or is it living life with God that should be our primary focus? Speaking from my own experience, <laughs> Living for God often became an impersonal, rule-driven routine. You can just go through the motions. You can be living for God, but not really living with Him. And there's a huge difference there, and it's dangerous. What I've found is that when I focus my daily living on living life with God, living for God takes care of itself. I think this shift of understanding made a huge and significant difference in my own life, and I'd encourage you to wrestle with that question and the tension that it may present to you. Perhaps you'll wrestle with it over lunch today or even in the coming week over coffee with a friend. The good news is God, by his grace, invites us to abundant life, life that is fulfilling, life that is meaningful, and life that is significant. Grace goes so much further than forgiveness. Grace offers salvation, absolutely, but grace also leads us to say no, and grace teaches us to say yes in a beautiful and ongoing exchange in our life. As we continue on in our passage, verse 13 says, while well, we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Grace goes much further than forgiveness. Grace also fills us with hope. Hope for a changed life. Hope for abundant life now, here on earth. Hope for an eternity with God. We are a people of hope. 
All this stands in stark contrast to foolishly focusing all of our efforts on just trying to change ourselves and our outward behaviors in our own strength and in our own power. To me, that idea has never sounded like the abundant life that Jesus spoke about, life that's supposed to be available to us now, not just in eternity someday. You see, when we focus on the do's and don'ts, when we focus on the externals, when we focus on rules, we commonly find ourselves in lifeless legalism, bound by rules and separated from any real real life-giving relationship with God or abundant life in Christ. So let's be clear. Following rules is much different than following Jesus. And there are many people that don't seem to recognize the difference. One is a lifeless dead end. The other leads to the abundant life and the continual inner transformation that I believe many people are longing for. Thank God that he calls us to something greater than following rules. Thank God that he calls us into dynamic relationship with him. Thank God that his grace which leads us, empowers us, and fills us with hope. Hope for today and life-changing hope for our future as well. As we live in Christ, as we live with him, as we grow in our daily dependence and trust upon God by his grace, God fills us with hope. Hope that our lives will continually be transformed as we live in the here and now and also hope for eternity, thank God. Verse 14, our last verse of our passage says, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. I really believe that in the fullest sense of what Paul was teaching Titus as he wrote in this passage, fully applying both grace and salvation that Paul speaks of in this passage, it it really means a, a changed life. Grace goes so much further than forgiveness. Grace is meant not only for forgiveness, but something that reaches much further into our character and our behaviors and our routines. It changes our fundamental nature into one that reflects the character, the nature, and the actions of Jesus Christ himself. Grace not only forgives our sin, grace teaches us how to live a life that is no longer captive to sin. What's the good news and encouragement for us today? God's great message is all about love, it's all about transformation, it's all about redemption, and it's all about restoration, no matter where you find yourself today. My belief is that God not only is ready to save and forgive, as we hear so often, he's also ready to transform us from the inside out and to teach us on an ongoing and daily basis. Thank God. Just an observation that I've had in, in especially the last two years. I've always found it a bit peculiar that in many of our churches, we most often address Jesus as Lord and Savior. And again, some of you might be surprised that I've noticed that because it seems very obvious. In our singing, as we read through Scripture, Jesus is often referred to as Lord and Savior. And just so we're clear... (laughs) Nobody walk out. I don't have a problem with that. But when we look through Scripture, especially in recent years, I've just noticed Jesus is most often referred to as, not as Lord or Savior, he's most often referred to as teacher. It's got me thinking. Perhaps we need to begin to see Jesus as our teacher, the one who loves us and guides us through our days, teaching us how to live this life that he's called us to. Yes, we've emphasized that he's Lord and Savior, but how desperately we need to remember that he's our ever-present teacher. It's not like he's just called us and forgiven. Okay, go get him. I'm staying here. (laughs) He's with us. He's with us through every moment of our day to teach us, to continue to train us in righteousness, to continue to lead us in hope and encouragement that comes only from him. God's wonderful grace doesn't just forgive us. It goes much further. God's grace teaches us a new way to live our life with God. Thank God that Jesus doesn't just say, go and sin no more. He also makes this command possible by his grace and presence with us. It's a beautiful transformation for our lives that happens from the inside out as we trust him, as we depend on him, as we learn from him day by day through our victories, through our failures on those days that are bright and hopeful, and also on those days where nothing seems to be going right and you feel like giving up because we all are there once in a while. See, God meets us no matter where we find ourselves. God is eager to teach us what it means to continue to live for him no matter what difficulties we might be facing. It might be an odd thing to say on a communion Sunday morning, but I once heard somebody ask the question, have we focused so much on Jesus' death that we've forgotten about his life and the example that he's given us on how to live? 
See, Jesus is an ever-present teacher for us. He's patient, he's present, he's loving, and he's available. Jesus as Lord and Savior, absolutely. But he's also our teacher, showing us how to continually walk an abundant, relevant, and significant life. So at the beginning of my message, I talked about attention. We can't just sit back and do nothing, waiting for God to change us. But we know we can't truly change ourselves from the inside out either, so what are we to do? My encouragement to you today is to consider living life with God. Be aware of Jesus as a teacher and as a mentor. Allow him to show you habits and disciplines that you can grow in, times and spaces where you can experience the presence of God throughout your day, not having to wait till you get back home or wait until Sunday to get to church. Every day, moments of your day where you know the presence of God is with you. You know that Jesus is teaching you through your day and giving encouragement and love and direction for you. This is the abundant life that we're called to. You see, it's a partnership. We do what we can do, and we trust that God will meet us in those routines and do what only he can do in us and through us by his grace. I want to conclude this morning by simply reading a scripture. Uh, it's a paraphrase of a passage in scripture. I don't want you to look it up this morning. I just need you to listen to it. All week long, I was, <laughs> I was unsettled as to how to end the message, and I prayed and I listened, but again, God didn't seem to be overly concerned with my timeline this week waking me up at four in the morning and waiting till yesterday to give me this. It was yesterday afternoon when I recalled a couple of phrases and was able to track it down. The particular passage that I was reminded of is from the message paraphrase of, of Matthew 11, uh, verses 28 to 30, and it ties together many of the themes and ideas that we've been examining here this morning. I could think of no better way to conclude the message. What I'm going to read, you can close your eyes, you can kind of just imagine, Jesus, this, these are the words of Jesus. Just imagine him saying this to you this morning in light of what we've talked about. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. What an invitation for us today to walk with Jesus, to work with Jesus, to learn the unforced rhythms of grace, and to keep company with Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Father, this is the prayer of my heart for all of us that are here today. That we would be a people who know you. Not know about you, but we would know you. That we would be people who live each day of our life with God. Keenly aware of your constant presence throughout our days. Father, teach us to be aware of your presence and to be attentive to what you would have us to do or even what not to do in moments of our days. Help us to take inventory of our life, our time, our money, our attention, and our decisions, and show us what we can exchange so that we too can choose what is better. Jesus, we want to respond to your invitation. We want to walk with you. We want to work with you. We want to learn those unforced rhythms of grace Moving forward, we want to keep company with you in all the moments of our days. But God, we need your help. We need your amazing, life-changing grace. We need your miraculous power to continue to change us from the inside out, to be our patient teacher, and to be a loving mentor for us. In Jesus' name, amen.